Hi everyone, in this video I'll be solving the first PREC exams sample. The first thing we do is download the file to the computer and it's in my downloads folder. Open Eclipse. Sometimes Eclipse can give you this window in the beginning. Click on Workbench, then click on F File import choose general not archive file but existing projects into workspace then select archive file in downloads choose the file that you have and finish the project that we have imported has three files and the only file you're supposed to modify is all in one dot java Question one is based on classes and objects, week three lecture, and it's worth 45 marks. Questions two, three, four are problem solving based. Question four being the advanced question and are total worth a total of 55 marks. Make sure that you do not delete curly brackets or add extra curly brackets because that's gonna make your program behave in funny ways. The tests are provided in all-in-one test.java. Here's the test for set quantity, set unit price, default constructor, parameterized constructor, the method total price, question two, max digit, which belongs to the class all-in-one, the method count, which belongs to the class all in one and the name of this should be without negatives which also belongs to the class all in one we go back to the class and you can see that the getters are already provided you don't have to complete them set quantity is the setter for quantity and set unit price is the setter for unit price the validation logic is different for both of them we'll see how we implement it on our own without using the built-in methods so what should be done in set quantity is to set the instance variable obviously quantity to the absolute value of the parameter now if you don't understand what absolute value is take a look at the test so that's the test for set quantity, right? I create an object and I set the quantity to one and you can see it's get quantity should be one. It says assert equals one is the value of b dot get quantity. If I assign it the quantity minus 12, it expects it assert equals 12. So absolute value is the positive value of any number. So we can check if q is less than if q is less than zero, it's negative. So quantity should be minus q, or you can also say q times minus one. But the easiest thing to do is simply minus q. Otherwise, which means q is more than equal to zero, quantity becomes q. Similarly, set unit price set instance variable to the higher between zero and the parameter so whichever value is higher between zero and u it should set it to that value how do we check which is higher we check if u is more than zero it's u that is higher and unit price becomes u otherwise which means zero is more than or equal to u unit price becomes the higher value which is zero after every method or two, you should run the tests. And you can see here, set quantity passes and set unit price passes as well. So the two methods that we have implemented, in fact, pass. And your score is 30. So that's pretty good, isn't it? 30 out of 100, that's like 1.5 out of 5 already. The third method is default constructor. So if you watch the recording for week three, you'll see that a constructor is invoked when you create an object 
and it should set both instance variables to one. But we don't set it directly. We don't say unit price becomes one and quantity becomes one. Instead of that, we always assign values using the setters. So set the unit price to one and set the quantity to one as well. The parameterized constructor, you need to set the unit price to u and quantity to q using the setters. So that's the important bit, using the setters. Because if either of the values is negative, then the validation logic should kick in. So set unit price to u and set quantity to q. Public double total price. Return the total price for this order as cal calculated as the product of quantity and unit price. So if my unit price is 1.5 and I've got five items, the total price is five times 1.5, which is 7.5. So it is, how many items do you have? Multiplied by what's the price of every item. Save this. Run the tests, and you can see the score is 50. So in the sample exam, the score is 50, but in the real exam, the first question is worth 45 marks. We can always change that. Next is question two, max digit int n. So given an integer, you can assume that n is more than or equal to zero. You're supposed to return the highest digit in n. So. I've also given you some hints. n remainder 10 gives you the last digit, and n divided by 10 gives the number without the last digit, which is the rest of the number. So we can assume that our max digit is 0. And as long as n is more than 0, it means it has some digits inside it. The last digit, as I've given the hint, is n remainder 10, and the rest of the number is n by 10. Now we'll worry about that later, but the last digit is n remainder 10. So we have to check if the last digit is even more than what we have so far, then the max digit should become last digit. Then because we have considered the last digit, if the number was 1729, we don't need to consider that anymore, but we need to consider the rest of the number, n should become n divided by 10. That's the end of the loop, the while loop. So when the loop finishes, we can return whatever the max value is. Go to the test, run it again, and your score has now become 65 because max digit has passed as well. Count returns the number of times target exists in the array. So in this method, I'll deliberately make some mistakes and see what happens. Because I need to count, I need to hold that in a variable. I'm going to go from i equals 1, and I'm making this mistake deliberately. i less than array dot length, i plus plus. Again, let's say i less than equal to array dot length, which is again a mistake I'm making deliberately. If the current item, which is array i, equals target. It means this item is equal to target, and therefore result should increase by 1. Another mistake I'll make is I'll add the return statement in the loop itself. Please note that the loop is not over yet. The first thing you'll see is when you save this program that there is a compilation error. And we are very, very strict on compilation errors. If there is a red cross in your main file or in your test file, because the test file is not supposed to be modified. So sometimes it can happen that you modify the header, which you shouldn't, which results in a compilation error in the test file. If there is any compilation error, we'll give you a 25% penalty on your mark. So why is this error happening? Because the return statement on line 99 is inside the loop. Now what happens if the loop never executes? It means this return statement will never execute, and your method which is supposed to return an integer returns nothing. So the first mistake I made is have the return result in out, 
inside the loop while it should be outside. Save this. Okay, there are some more mistakes. When I run the test, you'll see count has a red cross, which means there is an error. There's an exception that it caused. And the exception is array index out of bounds exception. It happened when I called the method count by passing this array and the target was two. So you can go and take a look at why that's happening. One of the ways in which you can do that is by inserting breakpoints. When you go into the debug mode now, by clicking the, let me stop this, go back. So you can debug a program by placing breakpoints wherever you want the program to stop. And clicking on this green bug, which takes you into debug perspective. This resume button or the slow motion icon is the resume button. You can see that the array is there. If I resume, the array is this and my target is 2. The value of i starts from 1 and array 1 is minus 4. So first of all, I'm skipping the first item at index 0. So that's my first catch. So I can change i equals 0 and start the debug process again. This time, you can see that i is actually equal to 0. And array index out of bound 0. Because now, when the array is empty, it tries to access item at index 0 because 0 is less than equal to 0. So my second mistake is I cannot go all the way to array.length. I goes less than array.length. If you get a, if you feel that you fixed the mistake, you don't need to debug it again. You can just run the program and it passes just like that. To come back to your original view, you can also move from this bug to what it says J, which is the Java perspective. So here I come back to Java perspective. I don't need these breakpoints anymore. The last method is return an array containing all the non-negative items. This is just a placeholder array I've created, but to complete our code, if, you, if you're gonna complete the code, just comment this out, just in case you need it again. To return an array that contains all the items which are not negative, you need to count such items. So count non-negatives is zero. Go through every item in the array. Only if the current item is more than or equal to zero, the count for non-negatives increases. When the loop finishes, you know how many non-negative values are. So you can create an array with those many items. You'll also need a variable to hold the index where the next non-negative items should be inserted in the array. You're going to run a very similar loop again, or the same loop again. Go through every item of the array. If the item is more than or equal to 0, then you're going to put that into the result. But you don't put array i into result i, no, because it's possible that only the first and the tenth item are non-negative. So you don't put them into index 1 and 10. You put them into this destination index. And every time you put a new item into the resulting array, destination in index increases. The last thing I need to do is, after the loop finishes, return the destination, sorry, return the array result. Now, the myth, if you save the program, there's no compilation error, which is good. You can go to the test file and run the test file again. Now you can see that the score is 100 is fantastic and all 
the methods pass and therefore you get a green line altogether. One more thing, sometimes you want to run a single method, you want to isolate a test. You can always run a single test by double clicking on the test name and then running it. So you can see that in this case only one test was executed. So that's about the walkthrough for sample track exam 1. I hope you've watched this video and it has benefited you and you don't make silly mistakes in the real exam. All the very best. Cheers.